Hey everyone, it's Colt, and today we're talking about CSS selectors. Specifically, the essential, the most important selectors, combinators, pseudoclasses, and pseudo-elements that you should try and know, or remember, or at least be familiar with. There are quite a few of them, I'm going to try and whittle it down and highlight the most important stuff. So technically this video is part of a series I'm doing called Colt's, Colt's Code Camp. Uh, this is day seven, it's our second video on CSS, but I'm also trying to make this video open to anyone. You do not need to have gone through the first six videos. Uh, this will stand on its own if you just wanna learn the most important CSS selectors. So every CSS rule set that we write follows this general pattern. We have a selector, or multiple selectors, or combinators, and there's a lot of terminology, but we, we select some elements, and then curly braces, and then we set our properties. The focus of this video is really about what goes in that selector area, what goes before the curly braces, um, and we're gonna start with the most general possible selector, the universal selector. This will select every element in a document. We use the star, the asterisk. Uh, it's not that common. Generally, you don't wanna apply styles to every single thing on the page. Sometimes if you're trying to remove styles or reset things, you might use the universal selector, but overall it's not very common and it's relatively inefficient um, just because you're styling everything. So that's kind of all there is to it. Star, and then you write your properties inside of those curly braces and it will match every single element regardless of the type. Today I'll do most of my coding uh, and typing in a code pen just to make it more immediate, easier for you to follow along. So this is my code pen. I've got some HTML, some images I've uploaded. Um, I've got a logo right now that is very large. It's not a logo size image. I've got a nav bar, unstyled. It's just three links that go nowhere. Um, and then the content of my page and then an image and you know some LIs, an ordered list, some headings, paragraphs, that sort of thing. Okay. So if you want to follow along, um, I will include both a link to the starter code, what I have right now with no CSS, and a link to the completed version with a bunch of CSS uh, selectors written out. Keep in mind that we're not trying to make anything beautiful here. We're just trying to learn these basic selectors. Okay, so the universal selector I'll start with. Let me make this a bit larger. Hopefully you can read that. Star inside of the CSS pane. And then let's do something like color teal. And that will make every single thing on the page teal. Assuming that we don't have any more specific selectors that conflict with that. And speaking of specificity, um, I have a video on CSS specificity, which goes hand in hand with this video. I would start with this and then afterwards check that video out if you're new to CSS. Uh, these are very important connected topics. You need to understand selectors before you can understand specificity. Anyway, that is the star selector, the universal selector, not that commonly used, but it's the most general, it's the easiest one to begin with. Next up, we've got a very comfortable bread and butter selector, the element selector or the type selector, where we select based off of an element's type. So here I'm selecting all images, giving them a width of 100 pixels and a height of 200 pixels. I could do the same thing over here. Uh, rather than height and width for images, I could select every li on the page or every anchor tag and give it some, I don't know, color of pink. I could select every Let's see, that, there you go. You can see an anchor tag there, it's pink. Here's another three. I could do every H2 and give that uh, a font size of 40 pixels. That's an H2 right there, so that made it larger. And a color of something else, how about uh, purple? All right, so those are element selectors. We're selecting every instance of an H2, every instance of an anchor tag. And a lot of the time that is great and useful but other times you don't want such a wide sort of blanket cast across your application. You may not want every anchor tag to be pink. I might want to style my nav bar differently than the links that are just uh, in line in my content. I might want to call out one of these H2s differently instead of all three of them being purple. So the element selector is useful and it's commonly used, but there are many other options. First up, uh, we have the class selector. So in order to use the class selector, we need to add an attribute called class to our markup. A class is something that we define. It's totally up to us to come up with a name. Basically, it's a way of grouping elements together so that we can style them later in CSS. So on this page, I have three different spans, just a generic span element. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a way of selecting some text or singling it out. 
So I have a span around these three ex or four exclamation points. I might want to make them larger or a different color or something to emphasize them. I have a span around my up arrow and a span around the heart. So if I were to style all spans and maybe make them red and give them a larger font size, about uh, 20 pixels to make them stand out a bit. Mm, it's not much larger. How about 40 pixels? Let's say that I want that to happen here and here, but I don't want it to happen to my exclamation points. Without changing the elements that I'm using, span, span, and span, it kind of makes sense to use spans here because uh, that's the point of a span. It's just a generic container to go around text, inline text. If I don't want to style this one, and I do want to style these two icons, I could come up with some class. It's just a name that I'll remember and use in my CSS. So for these two, I might come up with a class called icon. All I need to do is add an attribute called class, and I'll set that name to be icon on both of them. Class equals icon. So both of those spans now have that class. Nothing changes, but now instead of selecting all spans, I can select based off of the class name. And the selector syntax for a class name is to use a dot, a period, and then the name of the class the exact name that we used in the class attribute. So period icon. That will select anything with the class name of icon. So color red, font size will be uh, 30 pixels maybe. Okay, so we can see that it is working for these two. And our span up here that does not have that class is completely untouched. So that's how you select based off of a class. Out of everything that we do in CSS, I'd say selecting by class name is probably the most common. We have a lot of classes, lots of times. There are so many situations where we want to divide up portions of the markup, use a class, maybe not even just on one element type. I could use the icon class on anything. It doesn't have to be an icon. I could apply that to, uh, I don't know, this heading here, and we'll get the same result can see that it's now red and 30 pixels. So that's class selector. Next we have a similar concept, the ID selector. So an ID is another way of adding a hook into our markup, um, a name or a label that we can reference in our CSS. But the difference is that we use a class to group multiple elements, uh, come up with a class of elements that we can style similarly. Whereas IDs are supposed to be unique on a given document. So we single out one and only one element by using the ID selector. So IDs are less common uh, because generally you might need some IDs on a page to style something differently, but you shouldn't be adding IDs to every single thing that you're styling. There are much better ways of doing it. So an example here, um, I've got these two images. And if I wanted to resize those images, because they're both pretty large, Right? I've got this logo up top, then I've got my cat picture down here. I might select all images and give them a width of 200 pixels. That might be a bit small for this. Maybe 300 pixels, but that's still going to be too large for my logo. I want that to be much smaller. So I can give this one image an ID. I'll give it a name. Uh, how about logo? So on that image, I'll just set ID, which is another attribute, and I'll set it to logo. It's just a name that I need to reference over here. And the syntax to select by ID is the hash symbol or the pound sign, the octothorpe, uh, and then the name of the ID, logo. And now I can give that a much smaller size. How about 100 pixels? Yeah, I think that's better. Maybe even smaller, maybe 80 pixels. Sure. And I've got my logo. I've singled out that one element. So I should not use that ID anywhere else on the page an ID is a one-time only thing. Now you can have multiple IDs on the page. I could use an ID around this uh, span down here if I wanted to style that differently, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. So classes can be used multiple times on the page. That's the whole point. We use the dot selector with the class name, and then an ID is supposed to be used one time and only one time, at least each ID used one time per page. And we use the hash sign. Next up, selector list, which is a way of grouping selectors uh, and styling them in the same way. So selecting multiple types of elements or multiple classes, multiple things, we just use the comma. So rather than, let's say, styling um, paragraphs, or let's do it H1 and H2s, if I want to make them both pink, I could do H1 color pink, 
h2 color pink but if that's all I'm doing I'm making both of those elements pink it's much easier just to do h1 comma h2 set that color to be pink so we get the same results but now we just wrote one selector well technically it's two selectors but one rule set here one pair of curly braces we can use any selectors and combine them or group them together using the comma. So I could select that image with a ID of logo and then regular images and anything that has the class name of logo. So I've got an ID selector, an element or a type selector and a class selector, and I can make them all have a border. How about uh, two pixels solid red? Just see if that stands out. All right, so my logo has uh, a border there and what else? Oh, there is no class of logo. It was called icon. My icons have that border and the regular image, any image element also has that border. All right, so we can select multiple things and group them together with commas. Next, a different selector called the descendant selector. This allows us to select or target elements that are descendants of some other selector or some other element. So in this example, I'm selecting the anchor tags that are nested somewhere within a list item or an LI. So this can be really, really useful. Um, here's an example, a pretty common situation. I've got a bunch of links, there are anchor tags in here, a bunch of LIs, just to show you the markup. We've got LIs instead of a UL. And I also have another set of uh, LIs down here. And if I wanted to style them differently, selecting all LIs is not gonna cut it. If I wanted to, um, let's say, make my nav bar inline. So I want these LIs to be display inline. Well, that's going to work here. I now have my inline nav bar, but then I totally screwed this up. Now, one option would be to come up with an ID and, I don't know, or a class and give it to each LI in the nav bar, but that's relatively uh, inefficient or it's just not the best way of doing it. We have some unique information. These LIs are nested inside of a UL. So I could say only do it for LIs nested in a UL, which should work as you can see. These LIs are styled display inline, and these ones are untouched because they are inside of a OL, an ordered list, but I could easily have another bulleted list on this page somewhere else. So I probably wouldn't do that, but I might say any LIs nested in a nav somewhere. Or I could even say in a header, the LIs in my header element, there's only one header on this page, it still works. So this is a general descendant selector, an LI nested anywhere within a header. It doesn't have to be directly the first child or the first descendant. It can be anywhere nested inside of a header. I could even use an ID. I could give my header an ID or this nav an ID uh, if I wanted to and just call this navbar. And then I could rewrite this as navbar LI. So this will select the LIs nested in the ID navbar or the element with that ID and it still works as well. So that's the descendant selector. Then we have the adjacent selector. Honestly, I don't use this one very often. We use the plus sign and technically what I just showed you here and this one here adjacency, they're called combinators, not selectors because they combine selectors, right? We are combining the ID selector and the element or type selector uh, into one selector. Select the LIs inside of that ID. Same thing with this adjacent combinator. I don't really hear anybody use that term ever in the real world, but that is the official terminology. Uh, anyway, so this example with the plus sign will select the paragraphs that are immediately preceded by an H1. So it is not a parent-child relationship here. It is uh, elements, or it's only going to target elements that are on the same level. So for example, if I wanted to style, uh, I don't know, this, uh, how about the first paragraph? Is there a paragraph that comes directly after an H2? Yes. So this paragraph comes right after an H2. So if I wrote H2 plus sign paragraph, and I give that paragraph a color of uh, what's something obvious, how about orange red? I'll scroll down. I'm not selecting all paragraphs, but only the paragraph that is directly after an H2. And I might have multiple of them, but in this case, are there more? I think it's just that one. Now I do have uh, an H2 right here. That's an H2 as well, but there is no paragraph that comes directly after it. If I were to add in a paragraph like that, 
you would see that it also turns orange red. So that's the adjacent combinator. Next up, direct child. So this is another combinator. Uh, we use the greater than sign, and this is going to act kind of like the descendant combinator, except that it is more particular. This example here uh, will select the allies, only the allies that are direct children of a div. So not the allies that are nested somewhere within a div, but only the direct children of a div. Okay, so here's an example. I have a paragraph right here. You can see it right there. Your cat should now be free and you can go back to playing the new Animal Crossing or watching Love is Blind on Netflix. Inside of this paragraph, I have two I elements, one around Animal Crossing to make it italicized and one around Love is Blind. However, the Animal Crossing I element is nested inside of an anchor tag. So we have an anchor tag with an I element inside and then we have the I tag on its own that is not a link. So if I were to use this general uh, descendant combinator, the space that we've just seen, I could do something like any I element inside of a P, pi, it's quite the uh, sparse selector there, and this would select both of them. If I did font size, I don't know, 20 pixels, so I can be larger, 30 pixels, let's just try and make it noticeable. You can see that both of them get much larger. Let's do a different color, let's do color of, uh, mm, how about... I can't do purple. What's another good color? Steel blue. Okay, so both of them are steel blue now. If I, instead of using a space, use the greater than sign, which is the direct descendant, I'm now specifying that we only want the I elements that are directly descended from a paragraph. So they can't be nested further down. They have to be a child, a direct child of a paragraph, which is what we have here. So that is the direct child or direct descendant combinator, and this is the regular old general descendant combinator. You can be anywhere down the family tree. You can be, you know, if I had this, you could be an I tag that is a child, a grandchild, a great grandchild, a great 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 grandchild of a paragraph, and you would be still blue. But as soon as I put this in there, you have to be the direct child. Sorry, grandchildren, only childs, children, <laughs> childs, only children allowed. Next up, we have the attribute selector, which allows us to select elements based off of the value of some attribute. So in this example, I'm selecting input elements where the type attribute is set to text. So we'll ignore the other input elements that don't have a type of text. Here's an example. Uh, I have a form that has three, well, technically four inputs, one text input, two password inputs, and one submit input. They are all input elements, so I'm not going to select them all. Let's say I wanted to do something for the password inputs. Um, what would we do here? This is all going to be horrible looking. Why don't we do uh, a border two pixels solid green? All right, so they all get that. Now, if I only want the password inputs, I use these square brackets and this syntax here, the attribute name equals and then some value. So type equals, I said password, so we'll do that. Two S's, need to spell that correctly. Now only the two password inputs are being styled with this border. I could also do, you know, password and then use the comma, the group com or the list combinator <laughs> uh, to select multiple types. I would have to retype the entire thing though. So input type equals, and then I could do text as well. And it's kind of a long way of doing that. It's a bit clunky. You could select based off of any attribute. Uh, input type is relatively common. You know, if you want to select checkboxes where type is checkbox. Uh, things like an image source, probably not that common to select exactly based off of an image source or an anchor tag uh, href attribute, though you can. But instead, what's more common uh, is to use some fancier attribute selector syntax where we can do fuzzier matching. We can match, let's say, an href that contains the string or the words example. So it doesn't have to be the exact full match, but just example. So we have these different options. We have equals, which will be the exact match, like we just saw, an exact match for type of password. Then we have this here with a caret. This represents elements where the attribute name starts with some value. Then we have dollar sign, which is when the attribute name ends with some value. So .org, .com might be a, a common example. 
what I'll do here um, is select my links that are local links. So these links are not taking me to a web page. Um, they don't really do anything anyway. But notice that all the URLs, the href, starts with the hash sign or the octothorpe. I have another anchor tag down here for Animal Crossing. It starts with HTTPS. So if I wanted to select anchor tags, I'll zoom in a bit, where the href starts with, we use the caret. So instead of just equal sign, we do caret equals. And then what am I looking for? Just the hash symbol. And we'll do color of, uh, do they already have a color? They're pink. How about color of, is lilac a color in CSS? I can never remember all these colors. Apparently not. How about lavender? There we go. Lavender is a color. Okay. So it's a little hard to read, but we only styled those links that start with that hash symbol. The href starts with that. If we look at this link down here for Animal Crossing, it is unaffected. So that's the attribute selector syntax. There's more to it. Um, for example, you can do a case insensitive or case sensitive, although that's experimental at this point. Most of the time, um, it's kind of, well, this is my experience at least. It's very common to select based off of an input type uh, or some exact attribute, at least for inputs and a couple other things. For links, uh, anchor tags, and images, I don't usually do much with the attribute selector. Maybe we'll check for something uh, that is a local link versus a external link, but it's not that common. One thing I did not show is if we have a Boolean attribute, for example, a checkbox, which is an input type equals checkbox. Um, and I'll just add a couple of these in here. All right, so we have three checkboxes. None of them are checked, but if I make one of them checked or two of them checked, with that Boolean attribute checked, scroll down, we have two checked checkboxes. If I wanted to select only those ones, so I wouldn't do input type equals checkbox because that is going to select all three of them. If I wanted to style them in some way, unfortunately, um, styling checkboxes is a little bit tricky. They are not going to be as friendly or as accepting of your styles. If I try and give them uh, a border or a background color, you'll see that it's not going to work. And I am selecting all those checkboxes. If I do something like width and give it 100 pixels, we do end up with that 100 pixel wide checkbox, but the checkbox itself does not change size or shape. Unfortunately, customizing checkboxes is just a pain. Now you can do it. There are lots of tutorials. There are libraries that will help you with this, but we're not gonna worry about that. What I wanna show you is that we're selecting all three of them. If I wanted to select only the checked ones, I can just do that. I don't have to check if it's equal to something. I'm just seeing if there's a Boolean checked attribute present on some input, and if, it, if there are, then I wanna select those and then set their width to be 100. So you can see that these two have that spacing, the others don't, or the other one doesn't. All right, so that's selecting by attributes. Next up, we move on to pseudo classes and pseudo elements. Now these are um, kind of fun, they're newer, but they're a little bit trickier to explain. So pseudo classes are not exactly selectors on their own, they are add-ons to an existing selector. And they allow us to specify a special state of the selected elements. One of the most commonly used pseudo classes is the hover pseudo class, which allows us to style uh, any element or elements in the hover state. So when you're actually hovering over them. So as an example, I could do something like image colon hover. So that colon is very important. They all start with that, all pseudo classes. On MDN, you can see a full list of them. There's quite a few of them. Um, some of them are pretty niche, but hover is super common. So this is going to add some styles or style all images when they are hovered over that particular state. So let's do something like uh, we've got a red image there. Let's do a border of, I don't know, two pixels, solid green. We will not see that until I hover. And there we go. Green and then back to red, the default non-hover state. And now the hover state. I could also do something like anchor tags when you hover. We'll give them a color to show that you are hovering over them, like for this nav bar here, maybe a darker color, um, I guess just purple. So any anchor tag that you hover over now turns purple. 
As we've seen, there are many, many other pseudoclasses. They all start with a colon, and they all follow this pattern where we have some selector, and then colon, and the pseudoclass. So we don't have to just do this on elements. I could do anything with the class of, what did we call that, icon? Icon, hover. I could even do anything with the class of icon inside of an OL. So I can combine things. We just add on our pseudoclass to some selector. So this is anything with the class of icon, those two things, inside of an OL, an ordered list. When you hover over them, let's do color of uh, yellow, just to make sure that it works. There we go, we get yellow. All right, so that's hover. Um, some of the other ones I'll highlight here include focus, which represents a form input, typically an input, that has focus. So when, it, when we click in, that is considered focusing. You can see right now we get that outline. Uh, we can add in our own, let's see what style would make sense. This is all going to be hideous, but let's do any inputs. When it has focus, that is the pseudo class, we'll give it a, um, how about just a border of one pixel solid green. Ah, green is not good. How about magenta? We're not going for looks, all right? We click. Can you even see that? There is a magenta border. There's this outline that we get by default. I can actually get rid of that which eh, it's not gonna look very nice, but there we go. We've gotten rid of it. Now we got that magenta uh, border anytime you focus on any of these inputs. We also have things like nth child uh, and nth of type. Where's that? Nth of type, these work similarly. Um, let's start with nth of type. So nth of type matches elements of a given type based on their position among a group of siblings. So this is going to select not every paragraph, but every fourth paragraph, that's what this 4n represents. 4n is just a way of saying every fourth paragraph. So I'll show an example down at the footer. Let's add a ul uh, and just a couple of li's. So we'll say, uh, I don't know, what should we have? Privacy, policy. Let's just add a couple of li's in here. I'll duplicate these. Privacy policy, contact, um, cookies policy, and let's do one more. What would we have in a footer? Privacy policy contact, I don't know, copyright info or something. And then I'm just gonna copy that so I have a bunch of LIs. Okay, so I've got eight or so LIs. And now I'm going to write a CSS selector footer space and then LI colon nth of type. And let's start with 2n, okay? and I'll give it a color, maybe a background color will be more obvious. Background color of teal. Let's see what we end up with. And you can see that every second, every 2n li within any footer, now there's only one footer on the page. Now if I instead did this, all li's, it would be every second li within some parent. So here's the parent, the ordered list this time, the second li and the fourth li, same thing here, here's the second in this nav bar. It's still a bunch of LIs, but I'm gonna go back to footer. So 2n will give us every second, but it starts on the second element. So it's every even n, every even LI. So I could duplicate this and do 2n plus one, which is how we can specify every odd and give it a different color. How about uh, yellow? Not super attractive, uh, but this does allow us to do every even and every odd. You can do things like 4n or even 7n. We're just gonna see that seventh one there. We also have things like first of type. It represents the first element of its type among a group of sibling elements. So if I wanted to style this first one differently, I could do footer li, and I could do nth of type and then pass in one, and that will just be the first of li within footer and I'll give that a different background. How about uh, orange? I should do background color, it's just more specific. And let me fix this back to what we had before. Okay, so this does work, li nth of type one, but there's also first of type, which does the same thing. So that's first of type, nth of type. Uh, there's a last of type. We have focus, which we've already seen, visited, which you can use to style links that a user has already visited. You've probably seen this before. Uh, if I click that Animal Crossing link, ooh, 
Okay. How do I go back here? <laughs> I can do things like, uh, let's say, how about anchor tags? All links that have been visited. We'll just give them a different color. How about uh, just gray, red? I don't know, something obvious. All right, so I've already clicked on this link. You can see that it's showing as visited. Um, do I have any other links on here? I have these links and I just opened one up here. Now it's showing up red. Okay, so there are quite a few different pseudo classes. One that I haven't touched on yet is the not pseudo class. I don't use it very frequently, uh, but it is nice to know that it exists. It will select things that are not some element that is passed in or some selector that is passed in. Generally, not super efficient to use not, uh, but as you can see, they've got some examples. If you did not and then the class name of foo will match anything that is not foo, including the body element, the HTML element. So I generally don't use it, uh, but if you want to learn more about it, it's another pseudo class. Okay, then we've got another group called pseudo elements. Uh, these are similar in that they are add-ons. They're keywords that we add to a existing selector that we write first. The difference, uh, I guess there's two main differences. One is that we use two colons instead of one colon, although most browsers are actually pretty forgiving on this these days. But second, the main difference is that pseudo elements allow us to style a particular portion or a piece, a part of an element. So pseudo classes are all about states like an active uh, link or a checked checkbox, a hovered element, uh, a focused input, a visited link, pseudo elements. Uh, allow us to style things like the first line, the first letter, the selection, the text we have selected on screen. So here's a list of the standard ones. There aren't anywhere near as many. I'll just show a couple of them. Um, let's do the first letter. I kind of like the first letter one. Let's do first letter on this H1. So H1 colon colon first letter. Two colons and I'm going to give it a bigger font size. Font size of I don't know how large that H1 is, 50 pixels, and a color of, uh, how about uh, olive, is it olive or olive green? Yeah, sure, well, that is hideous, but anyway, that's how you can select the first letter of any element, or if we had multiple elements, if I did an H2, all H2s will have that first letter larger and also green. So you can combine this with any other selectors. Um, you know, I could say the first letter of every paragraph that is nested after, I don't know, what should we say, directly adjacent to an H2, like that. And you'll see that we've got, uh, where's our first paragraph that follows this? Here we go. Here's an H2, then a paragraph that is adjacent to that H2, the first letter. Okay. We have a couple others I'll mention. Um, we've got selection, which allows us to style any text that has been selected. So if I wanted to select text from paragraphs, like right now I'm selecting text, selection, and I can give it a custom style, like a background color. Let's do a, a cyan background color and a color of white. Let's see how that works. There we go. <laughs> And now I have my own custom highlight style. I'm not saying it's any better, but it is working. Um, but it's only taking effect in paragraphs. So this is not a paragraph. You can do this. I believe you can do this. Let's see. And have everything behave that way. Or you can narrow the scope down to a particular element or you know something like what we did here even. Okay, so that is selection. I'll go back to just paragraphs. Then we've got first line, which works kind of the same way as first letter, but it's going to be the first line of an element, the first line of a paragraph. And then we have before and after, which are a little bit different. Um, they allow us to insert what MDN calls cosmetic content, content, either before or after a given element. And the way that we do this is a little bit different than what we've seen so far. So inside of the selector, in this case, anchor tags, after, what we're saying is after every anchor tag on the page, we set this one property called content. And whatever we specify here between those quotes will be added to the document. It will be added after every anchor tag. So we could just copy that or at least copy the arrow. And let's do this. Um, how about after the links? So after every li in my nav bar. So I could do this right here. Select my nav bar. 
and then I want the LIs inside of that. After each one of them, I'll set content. I could just start with that arrow, and you'll see what we end up with. We get an arrow after each one. I could also do things like just add a little pipe character in. I guess it's pretty ugly, honestly, not a great use for this, but just showing you that it does work. We also have the opposite, which is before. So I'll do the same selection um, and in content, I'll just say something like before. So this allows us to insert cosmetic content. It should not be important content that uh, actually matters for your page. Often before and after are used to create cool, interesting effects. Um, and they're kind of a workaround for certain things in CSS. For example, uh, you cannot animate a border in CSS. The border itself can't be animated. But what you can do, there's a lot going on here, is have some element like this box that you can see in that orange outline. And through the use of before or after, or maybe both of them, you can add content that you can animate. So you can make like a, a blue box around it or little blue lines that are showing and hiding as you can see here. Anyway, this is done with before and after. Let's see if I can just find an example of that here. Here's before, there's before. Here's another example, uh, these interesting hover effects. A lot of these are done, not every single one, but at least these last two are done with a before or an after. So there's a circle. I don't know if you can, hopefully that shows up. The screen capture software I use isn't super great at picking up these uh, small details, but hopefully you can see that circle that is appearing from the center. There's an actual circle of content and that is set right here. Before there's a circle, it has a, a background here. I can change the background color so it's easier to see. We'll try that one more time, all the way down here. There you go, you can now see it. It's a circle that is showing and hiding. Uh, it doesn't actually exist as HTML. It's just there for style purposes. And then here's one more example. We can use before to customize the bullet points for LIs inside of a UL. So each one of these bullet points has its own, or each LI has its own bullet, which is just set up using before. So whatever content, you know, I could replace this with uh, a happy face. And there it is, there's my bullet points. It's a happy face or an emoticon. Now these are Unicode codes uh, that correspond to these nicer looking icons. But anyway, we can add in custom bullet points, we can do animations, we can do a lot with before and after. So they are relatively common, even if it seems like there's not a lot of times you need to actually insert content before or after an element. Uh, there are lots of workarounds and cool flashy animations that do take advantage of before and after the pseudo elements. All right, so we've covered quite a bit. We talked about the universal selector, element or type selectors, class and ID selectors, descendant combinators technically, adjacent combinator, direct child combinator, attribute selector, uh, different variants on the attribute selector, and then pseudo classes and pseudo elements. Now, if you're up for it, I have an exercise. Uh, you can find the links in the description. It's a code pen, so you don't need to download anything. Basically, I've given you some markup, some HTML, totally unstyled, and I'd like for you to style all of that HTML using uh, the instructions in the CSS panel. So there are comments, starting with relatively simple ones, give the body a background color of light gray. Then we have things like select the LI elements that are inside of the element with the ID of navbar and make them inline. Or further down, give every second blog post with the class of post a background color of Alice blue. Make sure you're doing this for every even number post, not the odd numbers. Make the first letter of each paragraph in each blog post 30 pixels. So there are instructions here. There's also a solution link if you wanna take a look at that. Um, I would definitely try it on your own first. We're not going for anything beautiful, but this is what it will look like at the end. This is what it starts as, and this is what it should end up as, and you can view the CSS here, but I'm going to hide it. Don't look at it unless you actually need to. All right, so lots of different CSS selectors. Uh, I tried to highlight some of the most important ones. Uh, you probably could hear, <laughs> I'm recording this after I recorded the rest of the video, and uh, I'm once again feeling a little bit under the weather, unfortunately, but thankfully I recorded most of this video before I started to feel this way. Uh, and I actually feel okay, it just sounded kind of horrible. So I apologize uh, for how I sound right now. And that's it for now. So try that exercise, I definitely recommend it. Um, 
Let me know if you have any questions in the comments. All right, thanks for watching, everyone. Please consider sharing.